This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. Learn fertility awareness from the comfort of your own home at your own pace for a fraction of the cost. Head over to fertilityfriday.com mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com mastery. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 364. Welcome to the Fertility Friday podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Today, I'm sharing my most recent interview with Dr. Laura Bryden. We are talking about menopause and pre-menopause, the 10-year period that comes before your very last period, the hormonal shifts that you can expect to see and how you can prepare. Uh, what I love about conversations about that pre-menopause phase of life is the opportunity to really shatter some of the myths and commonly held notions that we have been taught about this, this time of life. We've been taught to expect that it's going to be horrible and terrible and expect that we're supposed to have all of these really negative symptoms when that is far from the truth and there are plenty of things that we can do to minimize those types of negative effects during this phase. And we could even argue that the reason that many of us, many women do experience some of those negative responses is because our modern busy lives, we often find ourselves living out of sync from essentially how it was supposed to be. And a little bit about Dr. Laura Bryden. Laura is a naturopathic doctor and author of the best-selling books, Period Repair Manual and her newest book, Hormone Repair Manual. She has more than 20 years experience in women's health and currently has a consulting room in Christchurch, New Zealand, where she treats women with PCOS, PMS, endometriosis, perimenopause, and many other hormone and period-related health problems. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode. So I'm really excited to have Laura Bryden back on the podcast. Welcome to the show, Laura. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on and congratulations on your new book, Hormone Repair Manual. I'm holding it here. I mean, I think the listeners, I'll, I'll make sure to link back to our previous two episodes. I think we have yeah, two previous at episodes. At least two, yeah. But so I won't go into a ton of, I think people know who you are. But I would love to hear you just share, why did you choose to write this book now? So um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what prompted you to do that now. For sure. You know what? It was similar to my first book with Period Repair Manual. With this book, I was responding to what I felt was a gap in the conversation around what it means hormonally to be 40 something, you know, I, I think for a lot of women, we hear about menopause, we think it's often some distant future. It's a, something that happens when you're 50, maybe 60 something, you know, which is 60 obviously is way past menopause, but, and yet a lot of young women, my patients and followers who are late thirties into their early forties experiencing changes with their menstrual cycle, not understanding that that's part of second puberty or perimenopause. So I was trying to communicate that. And also at the same time, trying to normalize it and destigmatize it to some degree. And I, I'm quite happy because when I had a review, one of the reviews I had on Amazon so far was from a woman just saying the book made her feel like everything is going to be all right, which is exactly what I was going for. <laughs> this is a normal <laughs> life phase. It can be turbulent. It can be uneventful. This really depends on the woman, but 
bottom line, yeah, it's normal. It's not something to be ashamed of or feel bad about. Well, yeah, I think I'm excited to dig into that a little bit more. I feel like a good place to start might even be just to talk about it. Even the word menopause, Uh uh, I feel, because my understanding of menopause, the word menopause, is that it refers to your last period. And it doesn't necessarily refer to like this giant period of time when life is horrible, whereas the words perimenopause and premenopause tend to focus on that kind of period of time. So I'd love to hear how you describe that and kind of demystify what it actually is. Like, Laura, yeah. tell us what is menopause? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so perimenopause is the anywhere between two to up to 12 years before the final period. Well, technically before the one year after the final period, which, which would mark the end of perimenopause. It, perimenopause is actually the time of symptoms. If there are going to be symptoms, they occur during perimenopause or what I call second puberty. Menopause, and I use Professor Geraldine Pryor's definition because I think it's perfect. She describes menopause is the life phase that begins one year after the final period. So Mm. it's the next three to four decades. And it's, yeah, it's a time of low estrogen, kind of low progesterone. We enter into, we re-enter actually a time of low hormones because the way I'm starting to see it now through my lens is that as much as I love the reproductive years and I do, of course, I'm a cheerleader for estrogen, progesterone and cycles and ovulation. I think they're amazing, but they're really only supposed to be there for three to four decades. You know, we have our girlhood, childhood, when we have, we're a female body in a low hormone state, and then we re-enter that hormone state with menopause. So just to kind of situate that. And so perimenopause is really what I'm talking about in this book, which is the possibly turbulent time of transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, I think a really a great entrance into it. And you call it the second puberty. So yeah, I've actually been referring to pregnancy in in a way as another type of puberty, because it's a time when you're exposed to so many hormones and it makes all of these really interesting and fascinating changes in your body. You're able to lactate, you grow human, changes, all kinds of things. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about why you have called, I think it's kind of obvious in a sense, Yeah, I'd love love to hear about why you're (laughs) calling it the second puberty. Yeah. And just to come, I love that. I've heard you talk before about all the physiological changes of pregnancy that are permanent changes that some of the tissues go through for sure. So, but with perimenopause in the book, so in chapter one, I I provide an image from one of Professor Pryor's papers about ovarian hormones over the lifespan. And she shows low hormones in childhood and then estrogen spikes up first before progesterone kicks in because it takes girls a while to start a few years actually to start producing good levels of progesterone as they mature their menstrual cycle. So in first puberty, you've got high estrogen with really not very much progesterone coming through to counterbalance that. And then hopefully through our reproductive years, we have a good balance of both estrogen and progesterone, especially during pregnancy when you have massive amounts of progesterone. And then in our forties, we, it's a mirror image of first puberty. So just like, you know, progesterone took a while to kick in, in second, in first puberty, in second puberty in our forties, progesterone drops away first, or it starts to drop away. We start to have cycles, more anovulatory cycles where we don't ovulate. We start to have cycles of shorter luteal phases. Even if we're doing everything right, this is just part of the process of the change to the ovarian follicles. So progesterone starts to drop away and estrogen stays high. In fact, in second puberty, perimenopause, estrogen spikes up to up to three times what it was in our reproductive years, which is part of the symptom picture for some women. So you've got this very high estrogen, lowish progesterone, analogous to first puberty. And that's where, that's where you get a lot of symptoms that young teenagers would get. And then you get again in your forties. So examples would be heavy periods, painful periods, potentially. And the other example is an increased frequency of migraines. So if you've ever had clients say, oh, like, yeah, I got migraines when I was a teenager. And then they went away during my reproductive years. And then they came back in my forties, these monthly migraines. So that's another example. And mood is another example, of course, that's affected by this dynamic, this high estrogen, low progesterone. Well, so 
a question for you because I feel like before I knew what I know now, you know, having a, a greater understanding of these changes, I was under the impression, I think maybe a lot of young women are under the impression that you know, it's just perimenopause is just this horrible time where mm-hmm. everyone has hot flashes and you can't remember your first name. And it's just this hot disaster of symptoms. Now that I'm a bit older, I see it a bit differently having so being as I mentioned, I'm 39. So that means I've gone through my teens, I've gone through my 20s, and I'm almost through my 30s. And each decade is different. Yeah. Um, and I feel like this phase, like the late thirties to early forties is when you like, you really realize that you're not 20 anymore and you can't get away with what you could before. Mm -hmm. I would just, I suppose the question out of that is, is it, so how would you describe this to all the women who are listening? Like if, is it normal? Like, cause I feel like our culture tells us that it's normal for this time to suck. So is it normal or is it a result of essentially our lifestyle? Yeah, it's, it's the second. Thing. Well, okay. It's not normal. Just like period pain is common, but not normal. Just, you know, similar analogous to how we're sold this narrative that periods are difficult, periods are painful. And yet, of course, in both our books, we talk about how actually when the body's healthy, the period, the menstrual cycle should be symptomless, should just come. It's an expression of health. The same is true for the perimenopause transition. Now, the reason I'm saying it a little bit hesitantly, of course, I I never with any of this want to give the impression that if women have symptoms, it's because they're doing something wrong. It's of course, it's not that simple. It's a, in the book, I talk a little bit about evolutionary mismatch, which is a, a, because I'm an evolutionary biologist. So I see every, in the background, I see everything through that lens (laughs) in the sense that menopause the transition to no to not cycling anymore this post reproductive years is something that evolved it's something our ancestors have had for a long time i just i in the book i debunk this idea that we menopause is the result of an accident of living too long and that's just not the case at all several lines of evidence suggest that human the human lifespan has been 70 or 80 for a long time and actually the the beneficial post-reproductive years for women, like the benefit on their community has been there for a long time, may even have been selected for from an evolutionary perspective. So menopause is part of being human. Most information we have from existing forager groups and sort of traditional peoples, they don't, they report menopause. They, you, they know you stop getting your period, you stop being able to make babies in your kind of late forties, but they don't report symptoms associated with it. You know, I think traditionally what it would have been is you have your last baby in your early forties and then you breastfeed for a few years and then you just cruise into that's it, right? No more ovulations without symptoms. So the fact that we have symptoms in our modern world is the result of lots of different things, including food environment, including stress levels, including environmental toxins to some degree. I share a couple of papers in the book. And it's only really like two sentences. I don't know if you mentioned them, but there's these sent- a couple of studies about lead exposure and the body burden of lead in our bones that we would have accumulated over a lifespan, especially those of us like me. I was, when I was a kid, there was leaded gasoline, right? So yeah. it's like, if you, if you were a kid in the sixties, yeah. you potentially were exposed to Sounds that like lead in the paint too I know and then the idea is of course the body stores that in bones and menopause is or perimenopause the final stages of perimenopause is associated with this increased bone turnover so you're potentially releasing some of those toxins and there's a couple of papers to suggest that at least some of the mood symptoms and even brain fog and cognition problems could in part be attributed to exposure to lead, just as an example. I mean, I think that's, that's not the only thing that's going on, but there's several reasons why I think in our modern society, this, what should be a normal symptomless transition is associated with symptoms. And of course, in the book, I provide all kinds of strategies for relieving those symptoms because we don't want women to suffer. And my experience is for most of my patients, there's a way, there's a way to feel better. It's, it's always possible. Well, so I always 
I always feel like, I mean, my perspective is really interesting because I look at everything through the lens of the menstrual, menstrual cycle. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. The way that I look at it, there's a, a whole lot of women who use birth control. And so this isn't like a diss on birth control. I'm trying to make an example here. Just yeah, plenty of women that use birth control for a long time throughout their reproductive lives. And so the way I look at it, if I see the menstrual cycle as a vital sign is that if, if there was some hints that your cycle was trying to give you, you know, a little bit of spotting before your period or potentially some increased PMS symptoms, both, which would be associated with low progesterone, for example, you're not necessarily getting those subtle hints on a regular basis because you're having the cycle, the standard cycle with hormonal contraceptives. And so then at some point, many women have children and then they, you know, maybe their partner gets snipped. And so then they kind of find themselves having a cycle when they're a bit older. And so I often just wonder about, about that, because if you're in a situation like that, where all of a sudden you're faced with a cycle and you start having all these issues and problems without having those years of practice to kind of work with it. Uh, And also you're at a time when you can't get away with as much. So what I see in the cycles is that women in their twenties, like you can like not sleep and like go on a drinking binge every now and then and like work yourself to the bone and you kind of recover. It's not really, you might have a weird cycle, but you kind of recover, but women in their forties, you can't really get away with it. And so I feel like I'm not like, I'd love to hear, because you mentioned that the hormones change, estrogen's yes. higher, progesterone's lower. And certainly it seems just that the body is, it's not that the body isn't capable of making progesterone, but certainly it's like way more susceptible to stress. Like I'd, I'd be really interested to hear what you found, uh, what your take is on yeah. how stress affects us differently as we get older. For sure. All those are all excellent points. So first is to agree with your point that, you know, if a woman's having trouble with her periods in her forties, but those are the first menstrual cycles she's had in 15 years, as opposed to pill bleeds, then yeah, you can't blame all of that on perimenopause. That's just, you know, maybe she's revealing what's kind of going on with her menstrual cycle, especially, especially, yeah, if she didn't have an opportunity over her reproductive years to really mature her menstrual cycle, you know, you know what, actually just like talking about maturing the menstrual cycle, but the first time I ever kind of really knew about that was when you interviewed Geraldine Pryor and I was listening, I remember <laughs> I was sitting when I was listening to you two talking, I was getting my hair done. And I was like, oh my goodness. You know, she's talking about how it takes 12 years to mature the menstrual cycle. And then I, so well, I, and just to interject for a second, like yeah. it makes perfect sense if you think about it, because if any of you know the women listening remember when you first got your breast buds, it's not like you yeah. woke up with breasts. No. It took several years to mature. And then you get older and if you have kids, yeah. they mature again. So uh, yeah. It makes perfect sense that it would take a little bit of time for all of these mechanisms to mature. Exactly. So in one scenario, if a woman's been able to men- menstruate cycle naturally all her life, especially probably if she had some pregnancies in there, which as you point out, also are a maturation process, then she may move into her 40s and find her, her cycles pretty stable. She's perhaps not getting as many symptoms with it as someone who spent decades on the pill, for example. And then there's the other half of what you were just talking about, which was that because the menstrual cycle is our monthly report card, if there are things going on with our health, they show up in our cycle. And yes, it's just in general, just being a human, there are going to be more things going on with our health in our forties because we're we're trending more to insulin resistance, for example, which is a big theme in my book where yes, potentially have a higher degree of maybe sort of brain inflammation that's making it less easy to cope with stress. We, we, you also potentially have a lot going on in your life just because of that being that age. So there's a combination of things that are perhaps making it harder to have that vital, healthy menstrual cycle. And then that's compounded with the fact that you're just generally on a trajectory where the ovarian follicles are becoming less responsive because they're genetically programmed to do that at some point in your forties. And so I do want to acknowledge the point that there's a genetic component to this. Like some women stop menstruating up to 10 years before other women. And I, I just, my observation with patients is that I've, I've had very healthy biologically young, if you will, you know, patients and friends who actually went through menopause 
reasonably early in the bell curve of what's normal between 45 to 55 with your last period. And so having your period stop in your late 40s isn't necessarily a sign that you, it was well, definitely not a sign you did something wrong in terms of your lifestyle, right? Like, so there's, there's, there's d- different layers. There's your overall health, which is definitely going to affect the experience of it. And then there's the just genetic programming of at what age this all happens for you. Well, yeah. And it's, it's super interesting. Like one of the factors is how many eggs that you have left. So we're born with all the eggs and then menopause, you have a thousand left. So you're born with maybe a million or 500,000. And I know that that's complicated, but I think that that's also really interesting because when you said there's that genetic programming, there is this real kind of like, and then there's, there's a point at which there's no more eggs. You know, I, I want to, well, we'll just touch on this now. I've been watching the science of ovarian stem cells. So in both books, I talk a little bit about this. I, I'm curious, the science at the moment is that there are no ovarian stem cells, although there's some evidence to the contrary. Look, put it this way. Without question, the ovaries stop ovulating in our mid to late 40s, early 50s. Like that's, that's definitely something that's genetically programmed that's happening. I, through as a scientist background and as a biologist, I am not convinced of this, we run out of eggs version of it. Well, I've seen they, some articles that indicate, yeah. but what's interesting is that it still happens. So if, well, yes. if we were to play with that kind of stem cell yes. conversation, it would involve a lot of technology. Oh, for sure. No, it's, it's, more, it's more of a philosophical thing. Like, I guess it's, no, I mean, the reality is, yes, we, we, the, we, the activity of the ovarian follicles drops dramatically by our late forties. That's a reality. That's a biological reality. I would argue that's selected for from an evolutionary perspective. It's just philosophically and kind of as a feminist, I just, my narrative is that potentially if the science backs this up, we don't run out of eggs because that really is a very depletion kind of deficiency narrative. Instead, we could have kept ovulating for longer, but we don't because it was selected for, for women to, stop reproducing about the time their generation, their children are of adult age, right? So it's this grandmother age that I think that has been selected for. And it's a, it's an intentional, like from a biological perspective, like switching off of the ovaries. I don't know. That feels a lot more empowering to me that this is something we do physiologically. Well, when I say intentionally, I just mean, you know, it's been selected for to do that. And it's not just a, oh, we ran out of eggs scenario. I, this is just one of these little, like yes. for me personally, little things that I've, I'm keeping an eye on the science, put it that way. I'll, yes. We can talk more well, in a year or two about that. <laughs> let's talk a little yeah. bit more about that whole concept because I know that, so when the topic of menopause comes up in my programs and we talk about it, I recognize that I may be one of the few people in these women's lives and even through the podcast that is talking about menopause in a positive way. Yeah. So even I can sense the kind of hesitancy to say, okay, we ran out of eggs, even though like the research papers, like, you know what I mean? Like even like, it's, but, but with that said, it's because our culture is saying you're dried up, yes. you're running out of eggs, you're depleted. That's you're like, that's it. Your job is done, right? This yeah. is <laughs> the message. I, I mean, I look at it very differently. I think that my recent, well, somewhat recent interview with Alexandra Pope, when we talked about this whole concept of menopause as being this incredible so even looking at it as a second puberty it means that you're transitioning to a new perfectly normal and potentially wonderful phase where your you know energy is no longer necessarily primarily involved in reproduction and mothering like you said grandmothering or just having that energy left to yourself so I actually look at menopause as positive very natural shift. And I think the problem is the way our culture looks at women as only reproductive units, right? The menstrual cycle is only about making babies. And so that's our only usefulness and like, right in this world. And so I think that's why we tend to kind of look at this negatively. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, in the book, I talk about some of the, I talk about a book by um, historian Susan Mattern called The Slow Moon Climbs. You can put this in the show notes. Show notes. She weaves together all these lines of evidence that from an evolutionary perspective, I can phrase this properly, that menopause, the the value of women's post-reproductive years 
the value for their group and for their individual genes, as in, in their grandchildren, basically, children and grandchildren, that women being post-reproductive was so valuable that it was the reason from an evolutionary perspective for the evolution of a longer human lifespan. Just to say that again, that so she basically makes the argument that humans evolved to live to 80 so that women could spend three decades post-reproductive, basically. Like, were that, were that important for the group? Like, if in most forager groups today, like women in their 50s, 60s, into 70s even, gather more food per capita than any other individual, right? Like, they're just super productive and that that's really the only way humans could have evolved because i mean this gets into the really into the weeds around evolution and hominid up evolution but humans are such that throughout our like million few million years of becoming human we always had to have quite a high ratio of adult to children like you had to have all these non-reproductive adults around to look after the kids because human as you know human children take a lot of work and you know they're they're they can't look after themselves for like 12 years or something so they there had to be this biological mechanism in place and post-reproductive women were part of that so I mean when I started when I read her book and started seeing it through that lens of not only are we not dried up and done but that we were from the beginning of you know way back in the million years ago becoming human that being a post-reproductive female was hugely important for the whole everything to work. That's when it kind of cracked open for me. I thought, oh yeah, this is, we were meant to do this. This is part of who we are. And yeah, it it just, you just know it too. Like, you you know, women in their fifties and sixties are get stuff done, right? Like even if they're not, even if they're not looking after their own grandchildren, they are getting stuff done in society. Yeah. That's a, such an interesting perspective. I can honestly say that I have never thought about menopause from an evolutionary standpoint. Yeah. And I do agree with you the importance of 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 women in that age group. I, I always joke about that in interviews. So if anyone's listened to the podcast, they probably heard me talk about it. But women, when they get past that magical time of life, they like I mean, they're so direct and forward. They lose yeah. their filter. They say what needs yeah. to be said. I always say like, it's going to be real interesting when I get into that stage because there does appear from an outsider standpoint at this, at this age uh, to be something that does change. Uh, yeah. And it's almost like you seem to like these women, they seem to step into their power Yeah, and they seem to just not be concerned about all the things that someone like me is concerned about. There's a lot of things surprise surprisingly Mm -hmm. that I don't necessarily say in the public forum Mm -hmm. and a lot of women in the other you know those other age groups like they're done with you know like it's yeah they have they've earned their keep they have so much knowledge and wisdom um if they're professional they have a lot of professional experience and they're just going to tell you how it is and I actually love that about yeah about that age (laughs) yeah it's less um the people pleasing styles going down somehow it's, it's quite a relief it's just done we're not, we're not yeah. doing that anymore right yeah. it's just so and it's it's very inspiring to me and uh, wonderful opportunities that I've had in my life to absorb so much wisdom you know from women past menopause so I, sure. I actually look at it as a really positive thing so I hope that the listeners can take that aspect from yeah. the conversation so I want to jump back to hormones a little bit because I feel like in general, so even beyond the topic of menopause, progesterone is this hot, hot topic. Yeah. And I find it to be really interesting because from a menstrual cycle standpoint, I find it to be fairly straightforward to support a woman to improve her progesterone. It's not always easy, but fairly straightforward. You know, yeah. the first steps from my perspective have been to ensure that she's eating adequate food yeah. overall, which includes yeah. protein and fat, but yeah. you know, and then also to get sufficient sleep and to manage stress. And, but honestly, I have found this whole topic to be very, very interesting because when women have very clear and obvious severe signs of progesterone issues, they are usually very clear and obvious holes in her lifestyle and dietary habits that are corresponding. So the question out of that is, yeah about progesterone. Because one of the trends that I'm seeing 
is that now doctors are much more comfortable prescribing it. So yeah. it's like everyone and their dog is on progesterone. So well, in your opinion, and you talk about progesterone a lot and you talk about yeah. progesterone supplementation. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Do you think that women need this? You know, in is, is it a prerequisite? Like when you go through menopause, do, do, oh, do no. we all need progesterone oh, no. or like, do you think it's overprescribed? Like what, where are you on this topic? I certainly, well, the starting place was, no, I don't think everyone needs it. I think it's for symptoms. So I feel like it's true what you're saying about like, if you're healthy, if you don't have insulin resistance, if you're, yes, you can keep progesterone going for longer, potentially at some point in everyone's late forties, it's going to drop away. Like that's just going to happen because that's the first phase of stopping ovulation. So and women can navigate that. I think if they're very healthy, if they don't have insulin resistance, if they're not suffering heavy periods or migraines, and they're maintaining all of that with movement and eating well, and I would argue magnesium is a big one, part of that, they can go through that unassisted. So no, I don't think everyone needs to take progesterone. I think if, I guess where I would position myself is if a woman needs help, with some of those symptoms, particularly let's use the heavy, crazy flooding periods of perimenopause as an example, which can be crazy as you may have seen with some of your clients. So just to give it a, a, give it a number, a normal maximum amount of menstrual fluid lost during all the days of the cycle would be about 80 mils, five tablespoons. Some of the flooding periods of perimenopause can be 500 mils. So 80 versus 500. So yeah, two cups of, I mean, that would be at the upper end of extreme, but that can happen. I mean, that kind of bleeding in perimenopause is obviously very serious. You know, the effect was yeah, you end up in hospital. Yeah. You, this is when women end up on the hormonal IUD for mm. sure. I mean, what when I started practicing, that's when the uterus came out, right? Like when I was, right. it, yes. when I started practicing in the 90s, no joke. I would say of women in their late forties of my patients in that age group, at least half of them had their uterus taken out for this crazy heavy, the, the flooding only goes on for a couple of years, but it can be intense. Right. So, well, so I have a question yeah, Sorry to yeah. interject there Yeah. So, because this is not something from my, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Yeah. So this is not something that like every woman in her forties experiences, right? Oh, like, no. so, so no. then, um, so share with us a little bit about why this happens. So I, personally have fibroids. I'm a black woman. And I also, yeah. I made my doctor give me a referral when I was like 24 because, you know, so many women in my family had fibroids and, yeah. you know, my mom struggled with it and, you know, she had a hysterectomy. I share that in the book. And yeah. like many of my aunts were in similar boats and cousins yeah. and all of that. So I'm kind of like, that's one reason why, but you're talking about specific to like, so what, why is this happening to these women and not all women? Yeah. Okay. Well, five. So different reasons to have your uterus removed. So well, but the bleed the, um, specifically the yeah. heavy like flooding crime yeah. scene, five hundred mils. <laughs> well, the truth is actually fibroids. So there's kind of two things going on. So fibroids can cause heavy bleeding, but only about one in ten fibroids will do that. So Professor Pryor actually makes that point that most fibroids are not affecting the lining of the uterus where they is can that contribute the to the size or the location or both it's or the location like okay. more than anything but the size can also be a problem as you know like if the fiber is too large that can cause other things like pain or pushing on the bladder in terms of the the frequency of fibroids amongst black women i'm interested to kind of know your angle on but i mean my, part of what's going on i think is vitamin d status so i include a little bit of that research in my book I mean there's, there's going to be a genetic component there's definitely... I wonder I mean yeah. I honestly like I so when I was a little girl like teenager I started straightening my hair obviously don't do that anymore because I have yeah. lots of my hair but a lot of women start using just for the record I've talked about this on the podcast before yeah. but I find that a lot of people who are not black don't understand that hair straightener if you leave it on the scalp it burns right through your scalp yeah, it's not the same as bleach. So whatever's yeah. in it, I don't even know, but it's not good. <laughs> and yeah. so it's really, really like it, it. It's not like yeah. So I wonder about the those Toxin. types of things, like sure. the epigenetics around it. If mom was using those things, even at a different point in her life, and she mm -hmm. stored some of those toxins, and so the, we could say yes, there's the gen genetic component. I think that that's pretty much the, the consensus. But at the same time, I 
just noodle on things. And I wonder if there's an effect of that kind of exposure for the beauty care products and all of that stuff. And I did a podcast episode about how there's many products that are specifically geared to black women that are super toxic, that contain additional chemicals that aren't even listed on the package that have been banned in certain countries. And black women use these products differently. We tend to not necessarily, like I shouldn't, I'm not speaking for everybody. Yeah. There's a general trend. Like I don't necessarily wash my hair every day. And when I was using product, I would put a product on and maybe you put product on day after day after day. And so there's like a different way that we use products. And so who knows, you know? So I think that's interesting. I think that's definitely <laughs> toxins could play a role for sure. I think that's an interesting view on it. Well, because especially that most girls start using, like, yeah, I can't speak to like, so, I'm, you know, please forgive me. I'm not trying to say everybody's the yeah. same, but like most when, you know, when it was like, you kind of start straightening your hair when you're a teenager and that's kind of when you're growing. It's not like you wait until you're a fully grown woman to like start using toxic products on your right. body and your hair and 13 all that kind of stuff. years old. Yeah. Yeah. Some women no, are I, using it when they're like 10, like some I'd parents will. Just, yeah. I'd love to see more research around that. Something like that, like body burden of those toxins and vitamin D, I think as well. Yes, is that, yeah. A big part of it. Cause there's actually quite a bit of research from vitamin D and fibroid vulnerability. So fibroids are a tough one actually, because there's no easy, as you know, there's no easy treatment for those natural treatments. Certainly the, I mean, there's prevention and hopefully conversations like this will, you know, change the incidence in future generations. But yeah, so if fibroids are present, they can be a reason for a hysterectomy, just circling back to what we were talking about before. I mean, and then there's just the, the whole unopposed estrogen side of things and the crazy heavy bleeding and those can often go alongside each other so you can get large fibroids growing in part because of high estrogen estrogen exposure to high estrogen through different mechanisms including environmental toxins and then you know anovulatory cycling and so you know unopposed estrogen bleeding because of that so at some point if there's going to have to be intervention I guess my position and drawing on Professor Pryor's work is if you're going to put in some, if you're going to need to do something, then arguably progesterone or natural progesterone called Prometrium brand name or Eutrogestin is another brand name. In my view is almost always going to be better choice than a progestin if you can make it work for women. So that's kind of where I come in. I do talk a lot about using progesterone for heavy periods, for migraines, for sleep and mood potentially, but a lot of, some women don't need that. So does that, yeah. I wanted to pop in with a quick message from today's sponsor, Audible. Did you know that you can listen to The Fifth Vital Sign for free when you sign up for a 30-day trial with Audible? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash audible for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. Now let's jump back into today's episode. Yeah, I think that puts it into perspective because I'm certainly, I I just like to explore those things because I'm certainly, like, I I like the balance of medical treatments alongside natural treatments. And I I always, you know, and I I think your example is really important because there's a lot of women who listen to this podcast yeah. who are averse to medical interventions and there are times when medical interventions are warranted <laughs> and needed and so I think it's it's good to have that perspective that it's not necessarily the blanket be all and end all for everybody and there are women who have very serious symptoms that there you know and there was a time when that would have resulted in a hysterectomy and now yeah. obviously progesterone is a lot less invasive and it would allow her to make me just not have that experience so yeah, it's really a strong point. Can we just talk a little bit about hysterectomy yes. and keeping your uterus? Like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I, I mean, we have, I guess we're, we're here in the conversation. So for what it's worth, you know, I think looking at the science and the evidence, there are lots of reasons to try to keep your uterus after menopause. So it, it's, it's done. I'm done with the narrative that this idea that, okay, if you've had your babies, the uterus is optional. That, that is not the case at all. Like for so many reasons, like for anatomically, structurally, it's all that it's part of the pelvis, like you know, things, the bladder and other things, you know, connect to it. It actually affects body shape to some example, just for just to some degree, just because of that, its role in structure, it's important for orgasm. I really can't emphasize that enough. I think it is 
So the whole topic of orgasm and the role of the cervix and the role of the uterus, that's somewhat controversial, as you may know. How do, but, is it controversial? Know, I feel like, is it really controversial? But I guess in a way, because I've, I've interviewed a number of women, like a growing number of women who have had IUD insertion. And, yeah. you know, to be honest, Laura, I didn't really realize the, the pain thing. Now, yeah. for me personally, I have, when I was in my 20s, I had, we, we've talked about this, I had heavy periods and yeah. um, my periods were really painful as well. So the IUD was like not an option. I was like, yeah. anything that can make this worse is not coming to my body. No. <laughs> but I was always a little, like just the thought of having something inserted into my cervix always just gave me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. But after interviewing all of these women, and not every single woman tells me that she had extreme pain, but most of them do. And it, yeah. it sounds extreme. And uh, knowing the role and also then the HPV issue where so many women yes. have abnormal cells and then they're having these procedures and no one's yes. really telling them that it could affect their cervical mucus production. No one's telling them. Yeah. It's, so yeah, go, you know, go for it. <laughs> well, just the cervix. Is what you're talking about, that especially some of those medical procedures done to the cervix. Oh, sorry. This is that was what I wanted to say. It's like the women will say, like, if they ever object and say, "I want pain medication," some doctors will say things like, "Well, there's no nerve endings in there." <laughs> it's like I tell know. that to my aching cervix. I just I did it. I recorded an interview. I don't know yeah. what, what order it'll come out. Like if it'll come out after this one. Yeah. But I was speaking to a woman like last week. And she told me that after her IUD was inserted, she had cramps for like a week. So tell me yeah. again about how there's no nerve endings, please. Enlighten me. So the obviously. cervix, the cervix is pretty special, right? It has three different nerve supplies, including the vagus nerve, which is very few organs have, you know, like very few kind of things that you can touch have direct innervation by the vagus, which is this cranial nerve. The cervix is super interesting. I'm not, you'll have to get other experts on to talk about it in detail. Like I just know there is some evidence that manipulating and damaging and affect and, or removing the cervix affects women in ways that we didn't intend, including potentially impairing their ability to have an orgasm, which is not to say the clitoris is not also involved. So this is the beauty. And this is the amazing thing about women's sexuality. Like there's so many different parts to it, right? So some women can have their cervix taken out and still be able to have a clitoris orgasm. Some women can't. And so I just think it's this whole kind of nerve network that is understudied, under, under just not understood. So, I mean, that's my short version of, I, I think if you can keep your uterus, please do. Like I'm making a little prayer sign. You know, I think it's, we need it. There's even some, this is now getting off the topic of orgasm a little bit, but there's, even some information from suggestion from animal studies that when female animals, when their uterus is removed, their spatial memory goes down. Like this, the, the uterus is part of a brain, there's a brain uterus nerve network that affects cognition. Like if you just really, like it's, yeah. it's, it's well, the, body, the body's connected. <laughs> yeah. And beyond that. So I haven't, I can't say that I've de delved into the research so extensively, but there are also other consequences as a result, because even my understanding is that even though, you, you, let's say, even though you go through menopause and you're not really producing a lot of hormones, there's still some hormone activity happening. Yes. So if you oh, yeah. remove the uterus, particularly in younger women, perhaps, but there's also an increased risk of other act, like life-threatening health conditions, heart conditions, and things of that nature. I think that well, there's more, the orgasm thing is very, very important, but there's also other aspects that are also important. And I mean, it's not much of a surprise that it's not really well known and studied given the history of medicine exactly. being very focused on men. But yeah, I would say like, like everything, I, I feel like I can make a blanket statement, you know, if you're ever faced with a procedure, you know, like, even if the doctor says it's routine, you, this is something I talked about in a recent interview with Kimberly Ann Johnson. Even if the it's routine, like oh, we're just going to do the the um, the leap procedure on yeah. your cert, like it's routine for the doctor. But we should all just research a little whenever there's any procedure that we need. I feel like I can say that. Yeah, I think one of the, I give the example in this in my new book, Hormone Repair Manual, to get a couple of strategies, two things you can say to the doctor. Well, one is to say could this be a watch and wait situation? Like just, just feeling it out, right? Like, is it, could we just 
kind of cruise, you know, chill for six months and check back in? And sometimes the answer is no. Like if it's a more dire cancer situation, then of course the dog, the answer will be no, you can't wait. But if it's a, you know, just there are some pre-cancer cells, let's, can we just watch and wait? So get, get that answer from the doctor. And I would say if watch and wait is an option, at least contemplate that. And the second thing is get a second opinion, especially from another gynecologist. I can't tell you how many patients I've had who were told one thing is like, oh yes, you have to have your uterus out or you have to have this procedure. And then they talk to someone else and they're like, no, there's other ways we can manage this. So yeah, short answer. It's one of those things that like, yeah. we all kind of know, like when you say that everyone who's listening right now is nodding their head, like, of course, yeah. that's logical. Yeah. But when we're sitting in a doctor's office and the yeah. doctor says, you need to come back next week for yeah, blah, blah, blah. like you need to get that the, the uterus needs to come out. You need to have a hysterectomy. Yeah. It's like something. It's, I don't, it's like something shuts off in our brain, and we forget that we have these options. And so we constantly yeah. need women like you and women like me to give us yes. permission to actually say, "Is this a watch and wait situation?" Yeah. And then go and get a second opinion. Yeah, it's crazy, sure. but it is what it is. <sighs> Well, there's so many other topics I'm trying to think of actually one topic. This is kind of a big topic, but we'll see if we can kind of, you know, yeah. not go in all the rabbit holes, but yeah. weight loss. So one of the things that changes, and you mentioned in insulin resistance a few times, yeah. Um, but one of the things that changes, and, and I think we all notice it. I feel like I can make a blanket statement there where again, we can get away with things in our twenties and even yeah. in our early thirties, but all of a sudden you're in your late thirties, early forties, and the weight kind of sticks and it sticks to certain places and it yeah. becomes a, a big challenge. And then what I've observed is that then we start adopting certain practices to try to lose this weight that are not necessarily helping the hormones. And it kind of throws us into this cycle of, I don't know, cause it's, it becomes harder. So maybe that's just, uh, maybe I'm totally off base, but share your thoughts on weight, weight loss in our 40s. Yeah. Think of it this way. Estrogen, estradiol, and progesterone have m- metabolic enhancing properties, basically. They're both insulin sensitizing to some degree. So in terms of, this goes back to how amazing it is to have cycles. <laughs> you know, women having natural hormone cycles have a metabolic advantage over women on the pill or over men in terms of insulin resistance. So when we start to lose those hormones, especially in the later phases of perimenopause when estradiol actually starts to be lower on average. Like for for the first half a decade of perimenopause, estradiol is actually spiking up really high. But later on, we, as we move into lower estradiol, we um, shift to insulin resistance. And so that's, and that's, and it's sort of a, what I in the book described testosterone dominance. We, we kind of, we get this, we're going to get thickening at the waist and not the hourglass figure we had in our twenties. Now, of course, the solution to that is to just kind of know that's what's happening, understand that, it, especially if there's a, another under, another reason, and especially if insulin resistance has been a problem just generally, and then it's compounded by perimenopause, you need to, all the things for insulin resistance, eat enough protein, find a way off sugar, especially if you're addicted to sugar, move your body, have a healthy gut microbiome. I talk about some of the ways, to, I'm sure you've had guests before talking about insulin resistance and how to reverse that. And just know that that's what's going to have to happen. And I guess for me too, personally, I've, I've just, it's also about letting go of the expectation that we have to have a hourglass figure of when, as when we were 25. Like, I don't know. I mean, I just, for me, I'm just like, I don't need to have that. I mean, not that I ever had that perfect of an hourglass figure anyway, but like, it's like the body's different. It, it, this kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. Like I tend, I'm now thinking that we've got this baseline female physiology, which is kind of childhood and the four decades of menopause. And then we've got the 35 to 40 years of menstrual cycling, reproductive years, which are kind of associated with their own unique physiology, which has these high, you know, high levels of estradiol and progesterone and all the advantages that brings. And at some point we have to let go of that. I don't know if that's helping. I mean, just to interject, there's also some women shift to thyroid disease in their forties is quite a common flare up to have Hashimoto's thyroid disease kicking in because of this remodeling of the immune system that happens during perimenopause. So it could be a combination of the estrogen and progesterone changes of perimenopause, insulin resistance, Hashimoto's thyroid disease. That's a perfect storm. I actually do a little illustration of it in the book for weight gain and 
those all need yeah, addressing. Yeah, it's just, it's getting older and learning about what actually happens in our body. I find this to be really interesting as well, that this conversation seems to be happening more, you know, I, maybe it's just because a lot of people that were in the health space are kind of moving through that themselves. And so yeah. they're talking about it, but I feel like I'm excited to see where this conversation goes because I feel like it's changing. It feels yeah. like before we were told what menopause was by men who don't have it yeah, <laughs> and what they thought about it. And I feel yeah. like now as we go through it, we're defining it for ourselves and yeah. talking about it and normalizing it and, and demystifying it and also sharing how to, how to cope with it. Because mm-hmm. uh, it sounds like uh, from our conversation that, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. And even if you have symptoms, we should know that common, but not normal. So if you're having symptoms, that's, I feel that it's still this vital sign concept continues because if you have these horrific hot flashes and everything's out of control in your forties, that's literally the vital sign saying like, slow down and figure this out. This isn't whatever you're doing isn't working and we need to do something that is working. And so I would encourage all the listeners to you know, if you're not yet in that phase and you're getting to know your cycles, I feel like it's really good practice. It's good to learn to take care of yourself in your 30s so that you're already kind of a bit more experienced with that in your 40s. Because if you don't know how to, if you don't know that you have limits, first of all, <laughs> that's a problem. We all have limits. And I think paying attention to our menstrual cycles helps us to identify those limits and kind of honor ourselves in a different way. Because you're not honoring this like fake idea of what you think you should do. You're literally honoring like what actually causes my menstrual cycle to freak out. You're spot on. The menstrual cycle is an expression of health and perimenopause is too. And that's, yeah, it's exactly like I have a chapter in my book, this book called Cycle While You Can. (laughs) So you're getting that monthly report card. And if that's going well, chances are the perimenopause transition is going to go well. I heard this analogy. I don't know who first came up with it, but I love it. It's like perimenopause is like a plane coming in for landing. So if it's super turbulent and like all over the place, it's going to be a bumpy landing. If you can smooth that out through your last decade of menstrual cycles, you will hopefully just touch down. That is great. That's good. Yeah, that's, I think that's very much what it's like. So your late thirties into your forties, that's it's time to observe your menstrual cycle, see what it's telling you, understand what are the underlying factors you need to try to address, whether it's stress load, body burden, toxic body burden. We talked about, you know, gut health, insulin sensitivity, combination of those and addressing those will help both your menstrual cycle and hopefully set you up for a smooth perimenopause transition landing. Wow. I feel like I couldn't have like ended it better. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's even got the metaphor of like landing and like, yeah, fantastic. (laughs) Uh, Well, Laura, thank you so much uh, for being here. This was, and I could, I could continue to talk to you for like the rest of the day, but we're going to not do that. Uh, But could you tell the listeners a little bit about your book and where they can go to buy it? Hormone repair manual. I will. Before I do that, I want to thank you for having me again. I always feel, I feel like we're kindred spirits. I think part of it is that we're both Canadian. So yes. I think this is the, like the Canadian-ness comes through somehow. Um, yes. So I'm easy to find. So my second book is called Hormone Repair Manual, Every Woman's Guide to Healthy Hormones After 40. And it should be all in all shops, all online shops, Amazon, all the usual places. And I'm easy to find. So my blog is larabradden.com, where I also have a newsletter. Someone was mentioning I should point that out because I do about once a week. I send out a little sampling of health news and then all my social media is at Lara Bryden. Awesome. Well, we will make sure to put all of that in the show notes. And yeah, thank you again for being here. Yeah. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 364. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Marisa. Always a pleasure to have her on the show and to talk about women's issues in particular this time, talking about menopause, premenopause, perimenopause, that period of time before our last period, and really talking about some of the things that we can do. I love her concept of quick wins. You know, sometimes we just really need to have some strategies, some go-to strategies for how to manage 
And certainly uh, Dr. Marisa's book and her approach is really refreshing, especially in a world where we're given so many negative messages about this period of time, to the point that we can forget that it's a normal stage of life that we are supposed to go through. And it's it's just a, a rite of passage. There's lots of different ways we can look at it. But ultimately, it is a normal and natural thing for us as, as women of reproductive age to eventually go through that changing period of time, that transitional time, if you will, where we we're no longer able to make babies. And and what's what's great about having these conversations with women who have gone through that phase of time and really looking at it from the woman's perspective instead of our patriarchal kind of male uh, society's perspective is that we can really look at ways to lessen any potential health impacts that we may experience or that we may be more likely to experience during that time. And we can really decide what this transitional phase means for us. So I hope that the Fertility Friday podcast will remain as one of the places you can go to have positive discussions about this natural transition of life so that we don't have to approach it with fear and with anxiety, that we can really approach it from a fresh perspective of being a natural process that we go through you know, when we reach that stage of our reproductive lives. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.